Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Thought Starter today. We are running through uh, how large data breaches land at finance's door. So I think a, a problem that typically was, um, you know, the experts for, you know, IT or cybersecurity, like everything else, seems like finance is now being... Uh, you know, dragged into this conversation as well. So um, we are thrilled to um, have Gavin, who is actually not from Deloitte. He is from Fshaw, um, and he is also um, representing one of our major sponsors, uh, Fshaw. So along with McKay Goodwin, Huddled, My Accounts, EXL Cloud, um, Fathom, Easy Collect, and Alana Bennett. Um, so an absolute dream team that have been um, able to put the Australian CFO Summit together. So again, uh, thank you very much. Um, this session will run for about uh, 30 minutes um, or thir 38 minutes to be precise. Um, and then we may have a, a bit of time for a few um, Q&As. And if we don't get time to it, I'm sure Gavin is happy to, um, you know, send through some answers, um, some comprehensive answers later. So feel free to pop in the um, questions in the Q&A or the chat. We'll do our best. Um, but for now... I am going to hand over to Gavin uh, from Fshaw, not Deloitte, and um, I will allow him to now start sharing his screen. I will fade into the, the background um, and uh, let Gavin share his wisdom. Thank you. Thanks very much, Adriana. Um, I've got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to move quickly. Um, at FCHO, I guess we we constantly da dancing between two worlds. On the world, uh, the world on the left of your screen is, um, I guess, the world of what you might term cybersecurity. It's the province of the chief technology officer uh, and his or her team, and they're concerned with kind of creating a perimeter around your organization, your organization's data, and protecting that, and protecting access to your organization. Our world um, and the world many of you inhabit is obviously the world on the right. This is the world of finance and accounts um, led by the CFO uh, or the financial director. And here we're controlled, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're concerned or orientated towards financial control. Um, we're using policies and procedures, callbacks and some technology to really protect ultimately the cash of, of the business and the financial integrity of the business. And, and at FCHO, we dance between the two worlds, but our orientation is, is to the world on the right. We do that because it's our business and because um, protecting against frauds and scams and, 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 and payment diversion scams and social engineering and this kind of new world of cyber fraud that really targets the CFO is worth being uh, concerned about and protecting against. And I know when we show slides or perhaps when you read statistics, there's kind of like a blah, blah, blah that happens in one's mind because the numbers really, they all go up and they all big. Um, but I think to deny the numbers is, is to, to be in denial. And, you know, according to the ACCC in 2021, $277 million was lost to payment redirection scams. Um, that's, a, you know, almost an 80% jump on, on 2020. And then, you know, to be a bit more specific, the average loss to the most powerful and predominant and fastest growing of those scams, which most of you would be familiar with, business email compromise, the average value loss is $64,000. Now, I imagine there's an array of businesses represented uh, in this audience today. And, you know, maybe a big company can weather that kind of loss, but a small company can't often can annihilate working capital. Um, I think a couple of things to note here. And the first thing is, according to the ACCC, only 13% of these scams and crimes are reported. So if you multiply by a factor of seven or whatever to get to 100%, you're talking about really like an over billion dollar issue, just payment diversion scams alone. This excludes card payment scams. This includes excludes other forms of cybercrime, just the payment scams that are targeting finance and, and, and going for your cash. And then that's, of course, moving up. And, you know, if we go blah, blah, blah to the statistics, we tend to pay a little more attention to the headlines. And there's just been 
an infinite number of them over the past few years as cyber crimes picked up. If you unpack the stats and the headlines, really what's underneath them are these three types of scams. Supplier email compromise, executive fraud or insider scams. There are others, there's a, there's a broad array of nuances on these scams, but those are how I'd bucket the three main scams. Supplier email compromise, a trading partner of yours, their email is infiltrated and they're impersonated so that you think you're paying them, but they've manipulated the bank account. And so you're paying into the fraudster's bank account, but all other sort of artifacts of the communication, the email trail, the email, the communication, all of it seems legit. It's just they've tweaked the bank account. Executive fraud, similar kind of impersonation, but instead of the fraudster impersonating a supplier, they're impersonating an executive within your organization, and they instruct a more junior member of staff, often in AP, to pay some supplier, and really the fraudster's paying themselves, and then you get insider scams. Um, and our, our, today's talk is not to unpack those. Perhaps you've heard uh, us talk about these and we've got lots of interesting content around actually step-by-step -step how these scams work. Um, underneath these scams tends to be a failure of some sort of password hygiene um, or a failure of financial control. But regardless of what the, the cause and the scam is, they all lead to a change in details, a bank account detail, a BSB and account number change, the wrong payment being made, and some sort of loss occurring. Um, recovery is difficult. Recovering the money from the bank is difficult. Now, there are two reasons for that. The first reason is the bank just does not carry liability. When you hit authorize, pay, um, instruct, you are the authorizer and the liability shifts to you. However, the other reason, as, as said by Angus Sullivan recently, head of retail CBA is, that's not the only reason it's difficult to recover. The other reason is, the money moves quicker. You know, banking rails are changing, payment systems are changing, tends to create more speed, which makes any form of checking harder that the bank may or may not do. And then he also goes on to say here, things like crypto and the fact that the fraudsters are quite savvy as to how the bank will respond makes recovery difficult. So all of that's happening in the world here on the right, the, the world of finance. But unless, unless someone was, you know, living under a rock as the phrase goes, over the past a few months, there have been other headlines. Um, and, you know, in September was Optus, in November was Medibank, and then this side of the year, there have been more, um, perhaps most notably Latitude Financial. And then all of these data breaches, huge amounts of data was taken. Um, hackers um, would uh, infiltrate the business, extract the data. Um, and, you know, that got us thinking at FCHA, we know there's a relationship between all these data breaches, which is really the, 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 the province of the CTO, as I said, because they're coming off the data, not cash yet. Um, and working out what the relationship between that is and the scams, which us as finance professionals need to protect against. And there's definitely a relationship. Our thesis is that the data breaches will lead to a huge uptick in scams um targeting finance teams and really what this talk about talk is about is building that bridge between these data breaches on the left and uh, an uptick in in payment diversion scams on the right and to build that bridge i'm going to just talk a little bit about data breaches in context i'm going to do a hypothetical step through using optus as a case study to explain and unpack how the data breaches can very specifically and practically be used to improve and increase the volume of payment scams. Then I'm gonna just talk briefly about a response and then just tracking time, I'll glimpse into the future where all of this might be going. But let's dive in to just looking at data breaches in context. And the, and the context for data breaches is very much as silly as the sound, the context for crime, you know? So a thousand years ago, it was swords, then guns, then go back the last three or four decades and you've got code. And today it's about data and using technology and applications to extract that data because the data is huge commercial value and all the technology and apps that can be used for good for uh, sort of integrous and let's say commercially profitable and legitimate reasons can also be used for bad. And I guess that's a sub theme of today that everything that can be used for good by us can be used for bad 
uh, by bad actors or, or fraudsters. So really, you know, why, why are these, you know, why is it all about data and data breaches and apps today? Maybe this, this cartoon says it better. It was sent to me recently for health and safety reasons. We'll be transitioning to cyber crime. Um, which is what all these sort of mafia bosses are saying. And, you know, many of things said in jest is true, as the saying goes, and it is a safe form of crime. But, but here's, the, here's the crazy thing. Those two data breaches, Optus and Medibat, were two of this many data breaches that were reported, well, sorry, that this many data breaches that you can see on your screen where con uh, Australian consumer information was lost. And in fact, 853 data breaches were reported to the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner under their mandatory scheme. And that mandatory scheme, as I understand it, is when uh, consumer privacy has been breached, you have to report. And 853 reports were made last year. Um, so clearly, this is a problem. Clearly, it's a growing problem. This is uncorroborated, but I've heard that Australia experienced and is experiencing 20 times the global average. Um, that, that, that metric, I've still got to validate, but it does seem like we are way above um, some sort of norm. Um, as to why, well, that, that's a topic in itself. Just a couple of reasons might be, as I've said, there's a global illicit trade in data. It has value. It can be sold, as I'll show in, in the next few slides. So that's up. At times of global volatility, um, whether it's COVID, whether it's post-COVID, whether it's economic uncertainty, whether it's war in Eastern Europe, global volatility goes up, crime goes up, all forms of crime of which cyber crime is, is a massive part. And then there's some more Australian specific reasons. This is an affluent country. We have a very structured economy and why structure works for fraudsters is they know the response pathways of authorities. They know the response pathways of the private sector or the companies they've targeted. And then lastly, I, I would argue trust is an inherent part uh, of our business and, 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 and societal culture. And that's a good thing and it produces progress and good results, but it can be weaponized by criminals and turned against us. Because if we're trusting, well, you know, then we're gonna be less cynical uh, and less cautious, perhaps. Um, as a just a step aside, if you ever want to check whether your um, information has been compromised in a data breach, check out the site. Have I been pwned? Uh, pwned is a, ga a term from gaming, as as so many things seem to be emerging from gaming and gaming culture. Um, so pwned is a term that gamers would use when they sort of killed off an opponent in a game. They owned them, so to speak. So, but they said pwned, and that's been used by this website to just check. Has your data been compromised? I put my email address in, and there are four data breaches in, in which my um, in which my information has been compromised. Um, so I'd encourage you to do that. It's a useful site. It's a reliable site. If if you do see that your email address has been compromised, I would simply go to those applications and change your password immediately to those applications. Um, so so that's just a bit of context for 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 data breaches. Um, and with all that going on, I'm going to get into the meat of the talk, which is how do those data breaches relate to finance uh, or, or finance targeting payment diversion scams? Okay. And, and these things that we as finance professionals are concerned about. And to do that, I'm going to use Optus as a case study because it was public. But I'm going to say this it's very important that neither I nor anyone else victim blames Optus. They were the victim of a crime and it was a nuanced crime. And I, and I understand why there's a lot of um, anger, frustration um, directed towards them or Medibank because very sensitive information was lost. But ultimately that's got to be balanced by understanding they were a victim of a crime. And it's very hard to be perfect as a corporation in protecting against these. Nevertheless, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step through, start with Optus because it was so public. So on, on, on the 17th of September last year, a hacker went onto the dark web and posted this message and said, I've got 1.1 million records, Optus mobile numbers, contact me if you're interested. That is, and I've had this confirmed, that is very much the message on the screen, on the dark web. Um, the term dark web comes up, uh, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get stuck here, but very quickly, you can think of the web as having three, three layers, the clear or surface web, the deep web, and then the dark web. The clear or surface web is the stuff we can get to via, via your browser. 
it's .com, .net, .org domains. Um, you go into Google, it in search engines index those sites. And that's only 5% of what's on the web. The deep web is not nefarious, but the deep web is all the information and content that sits on the web, but it's behind firewalls. Um, you need logins and credentials. This can be anything from Netflix's film right, library to a retailer shopping information to your bank's information. That's probably 90% of all the information sitting out there on the on the on the internet. And then you get the subset of the, the deep web called the dark web. It's only accessible by certain browsers. It's quite anonymous. Um, it can be used for legal purposes by governments and cybersecurity firms, but it's it's also often used for illegal purposes. And that's another 5%. So the, the, the hacker went onto the dark web and posted that message. Then a week later, they posted this message and they posted this at the same time that Optus went public um, and the media started covering the message. And then they gave more information. They basically said, I don't have 1.1 million records. I've got... I've got 11.2 um, million records. Um, I've got email, date of birth, last name, first name, really rich data. Um, and then they divided the data up into user data and then address data. Okay. Now, if you wanted just the user data, you had to pay uh, $150,000. If you wanted the address data, $200,000. And then bizarrely, they offered a bulk discount saying, if you buy both together, I'll give you a bulk discount, $300,000. Okay, that's for non-exclusive access to all that data, that user data. Um, in other words, they could sell that multiple times to multiple parties. The message was also to Optus. Optus, if you want your data back exclusively, so we'll only give it back to you, you've got one week to give us a million dollars. Okay. But they then go on to say, if you want to pay, you've got to pay us in Monero which is a highly anonymous form of cryptocurrency. So that's the message to would-be buyers on the web. And then, you know, Optus go out um, to their customers. And if you're a customer, you would have remembered this message. And they confirm what the hacker says, which is, you know, all this data has been taken. Okay. So our first question in building this bridge from the, that data breach to what it means for scams and for the finance schemes is, well, who would spend $300,000 to buy that data? Now, it's not more hackers. The hackers take the data, but others buy it and use it, okay? And uh, who buys it? Well, as I said, not more hackers and, and not more of these like, you know, supposed teenagers in garages wearing hoodies, but it's actually organized cyber, it's organized crime. Cyber crime is organized crime. And we, we often say this when we speak, you might've seen this content from us before, but bears repeating that. Think of cyber criminal organizations as businesses. They have targets, they have shareholders, they have investors, they have structure. They're intentional. They've got to get your money. They, they're not just interested in data. They want to use the data to extract cash. All the same technology you have, they have, maybe they've got better technology. They often they can be located all over the world. And very importantly, they need talent. They need skills. And just to underpin that, there was this article recently that was about a Kaspersky study. The cybersecurity company Kaspersky did a whole study over 30 months looking at the labor market on the dark web. So I checked out that study. And here's some interest, interesting information. On the left, they talk about how a team might be organized, one of these sort of cyber criminal fraud teams. And if you glance at that, you'll see that looks very similar to an organizational structure in your own company. You will have an analyst, you might have a developer, you'll have an engineer, you'll have a designer, you'll have a QA tester, you'll have an admin, that'll be run by a manager. You might not have an attacker or a reverse engineer, but nevertheless, you know, that shows how structured these, these organizations are. On the right is a chart for the past 20 months uh, sorry, 30 months from the beginning of 2020 all the way to uh, uh, halfway through last year, and how many job searches and job ads there were in red for on the dark web. Most of those would be illicit, not all, but most would be illicit. And there you can see at the beginning of 2020, look at the jump. And that was when COVID started, which I guess is some evidence towards what I was saying earlier, that as volatility and uncertainty goes up, cybercrime goes up. So anyway, you've got these, you know, the hackers sell the data onto cyber criminal organizations. They're commercial, they're intentional, and they buy it. Okay. The question that, and, and may, there might be more than one and they might, and, and they all might buy the data because it's non-exclusive. Okay. 
The next question is, what do they do with it? So if we just go back to Optus's communication, which was to customers, and they do the right thing. They, they say to everyone, um, you know, this data has been lost, but and, and you need to be vigilant, and that's fine. That is good advice, good practice. They also go on to say, oh, don't, you know, no passwords were taken. But for the cyber criminals buying that data, paying that $300,000 for those 11.2 million records containing all that rich data, that doesn't bother them. It doesn't matter that they're telling us to be vigilant and it doesn't matter that they don't have the passwords, okay? And to explain why that's the case, we realized that how cyber criminal organizations operate is very much the way our marketing team would operate, how Adriana's team at Wheel would operate, how most modern businesses market their products, okay? And that is, they will build, build a, this is how our marketing team operate. They'll build, build a broad demographic list. Maybe it's, you know, CFOs, procurement and technology leaders in Australia. Then they'll segment that into audiences like CFOs of small companies, CFOs of large companies. Um, um, sorry, just checking out the chat here. Sorry, see if there are any questions. Uh, they'll segment that into sub lists. Then they will run campaigns ad campaigns, marketing campaigns, initiatives against that audience, and they want that audience to do something, download a guide, attend a webinar, click on something, um, and so on. And then, and then marketing teams have a whole stack of technology to do that, legitimate technology, CRM systems, uh, mailing systems, uh, tracking systems, uh, lead enrichment systems. So, so that's what happens uh, on the surface in the legitimate world. Well, fraudsters, cyber criminal organizations will operate in the same way. We build a broad demographic list. They will have that list and enrich the data, okay? Uh, we segment into an audience. They will segment into an audience. We run ad campaigns. They deploy scams or schemes. We want an action. They want an action. They want to extract revenue. And this is how they go about, this is how they might go about doing it. So let, let's look at enriching data, okay? So you've bought your 11.2 million records from the hacker who took them from Optus, okay? Got 11.2 million records to work with. Now, they don't have passwords, but it might not matter. So um, if we take one record, and, and this is my somewhat handsome head of marketing, Nick Decker, um, and like you, Nick has a digital footprint. He, he does things in his personal life on the internet. He does things in his, in his commercial professional life on the internet. And he interacts with businesses and services and providers. And in each of those interactions, those providers will build a record of Nick, okay? And key to that record will be uh, an anonymous identifier string, okay? Um, and that string in their databases will be connected to name, address, identifiers. Now, the more you can connect up these things, the more potent your data is, the more useful and valuable it is. Um, and you know, if you bought those 11.2 million records off the bat, you've got a huge amount of data. In fact, if, if you bought Latitude Financial's data, and just remember the hacking, the cyber criminals company will probably buy the Optus data, they'll buy the Medibank data, they'll buy overseas data, they'll buy Microsoft's data that was taken in 2018, and so on and so on. So they build a profile. If you can connect these things up, you can be very powerful using that data. And all this data leads to other data. So if you've got someone's name, you can work out their employment status. If you've got their ID number, you can maybe work out if they're a director. If you've got their email address, there's all sorts of things you can just work out on the public internet, okay? Um, so let, let's just take, let's just take, um, let, let's just take name and address, okay? So if you've got name and address, if you've just got name, okay? We could all do this. If you've got Nick's name, you can work out where he works, who he works for, and who he and who works for him. That's quite useful. That was about 10 seconds. Now, if you've got Nick's address, this is quite interesting. If you've got Nick's address, you can go onto one of several property tracking websites. I think this one was domain, um, but there are others, and there's some sort of business-to-business -business ones which have more information than the business-to-consumer ones. But even this business-to-consumer one, if you know Nick's address, you work out where he lives, and then you could, you know, you, if, if, if you know the value of the apartment he rents, you could make a guess at his income. If you do a few more clicks and you know Nick's rented this with his partner, 
which maybe you could work out through Facebook or one of the more uh, sort of interpersonal social media platforms, then you can make a really good guess at his income. But even more potently, if you know, uh, if you go here, you can see that Nick rented it in March of 22 from Stone Real Estate Manly. Now you've got something really powerful, which is you've got context. Okay. So you've now got some information and a few clicks from Nick and you can, you can enrich that data. Okay. Um, but you've now got to go, you, you, you've got to, that, that's, you, you want to group all those 11.2 million records into segments, into sub segments. So if you go back to the Nick example, if you do that across a couple of Nicks, so to speak, um, you can create a segment called rented from Stone Real Estate Manly. And maybe that's 500 people, maybe that's 3,000 people. So that's a segment. Then across those 11.2 million records, you could go create another segment, which isn't rented from Stone Real Estate Manly. It's bought a house from Ray White um, in the, the Southern Highlands, you know, just making, making these things up or in Melbourne or, or wherever. Those are kind of personal segments. But using similar tactics, you could do more commercial ones. You could uh, create a segment of HR leaders who have recently changed a job. That's pretty easy to do. Now, you might be thinking, wow, how do you do that across 11.2 million records? How do you scale? How, how, do you, how do you move quickly and how, how do you do that effectively at such high volumes? Well, um, you could go on to, um, and, and cyber criminal organizations will be far more sophisticated than this. But just as an individual, as an unknowledgeable, uh, somewhat innocent individual who doesn't know how to code or hack, I could go onto a site called Fiverr. Um, it's, it's a freelance outsource website. You might go to Fiverr to hire a designer for a project or, 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 or find an events manager or, or so forth. You can also go into Py, uh, Fiverr and find a Python, which is a, 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 a coding language, very useful coding language for these kind of tasks. You could pay someone $15 to write a script that went over your 11.2 million records and extracted data from the internet for that. So you could outsource it really cheaply. Perhaps, you know, you don't even want to outsource it. That's about 2021. This year, you could go into chat GPT, uh, you know, the sort of the most uh, popular um, and well-known and, and sort of lauded uh, AI bot. Uh, you could go into chat GPT and just ask it to write you code. People think of chat GPT as a natural language uh, AI, but coding is also language. So here is me in a few moments going on to ChatGPT. I know nothing about coding and I've just asked ChatGPT to write me a Python script that scrapes details from websites, okay? And this is how quickly ChatGPT did it. And just, this is the older ChatGPT from a few weeks ago. You can now get already ChatGPT4, far more powerful than that. And that's me just getting ChatGPT to write me some code to scrape details from the internet, okay? So now you've created your segments um, you need to, to you need to create a scam or a scheme. You've got your segments and you need to create a scheme. Now there are two ingredients to creating a scheme. The first thing is you need a channel, and the next thing is you need a goal. For channel, I'm afraid the easiest one is email. So many scams just use email. And if we shift from email to messaging apps, they'll use messaging apps. Michael Connery is really a leading light uh, of 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 um, cybersecurity in Australia. Works out of Melbourne. There's a lot of work for governments. And Michael's been saying for three years, 90% of all attacks start with or including email. So you need, you need a channel. Now you've got your channel. Then you need a goal. Your goal is a click. And I can't say it better than uh, Brad Smith from Microsoft. He was, I think he's no longer, but he was the chief legal officer for many years. And he said, every company has at least one employee who will click on anything. And, and in fact, Brad doesn't say it well enough. Any, every company has at least one employee who will click on anything once. So I've got email. Sorry, I've got my data, I've got my segments, I know I wanna click and I know I'm gonna use email. Here's my scam. Hi, Nick, quick one. It's Linda from Stone Real Estate Manly. I tried calling you regarding your rent. We have two phone numbers on file. Can you just go into our portal and, and update it? That looks pretty legit to me. And if they've gotten into Stone Real Estate Manly's email system, it'll come from Stone Real Estate Manly, the actual address. So that is, that is in the individual space. If you go into the commercial space, the, the B2B space that we operate in, 
then Brad Smith's statement needs to be adjusted further. Not only does every company has at least one employee who will click on anything once, but every company has a supplier or a trading partner who will click on anything once. And then your scam can look a bit more like this. And this is a real supply email compromise that we stopped. Uh, we saved our customer from paying a million dollars to the fraudster who was, um, I've had to redact this, but purporting to be this contracting company. And, you know, that that is a tricky problem to solve. Um, so they're going for a click. What happens when you click? Well, malware can be inserted into your system so they can actually get into another system and impersonate you. Or often uh, fraudsters will just drop some remote access software. And this is remote access software you can buy online for call it $85. And again, this can be used for good. This is what an IT team might use to remote access your computer to fix your windows or repair an issue on your, on, on your machine. But it can also be used for bad. And here's a YouTube video, I'm not going to play it, of someone showing how in 20 minutes they can use that software to get access to a computer that they have no right to get access to. Okay. So that's an example of some schemes. How do they generate revenue? Well, uh, they can sell the access. You know, that this ac access was being sold to computers. Was, this article is, I think, from 2016 for $3. It's probably 50 cents now. But that's just one way. Rather, what they want to do is get into systems so that they can impersonate a company to another company and get them to pay. Okay. And, um, you know, sometimes we, we speak about the front door being locked. If the cyber team doesn't give access, the cyber team doesn't give access or allow for access because they're doing their jobs well, then fraudsters go through another door. So if the cyber door is the front door, they go through what we call the back door. And then you get into this world of email compromise, as I've been talking about, which is they get into a supplier or trading partner and impersonate them. So that takes me all the way back to the beginning of the presentation where I spoke about these scams and impersonation scams. And if you've bought all this data and you've just and used the methods that I've sort of postulated over the last few minutes, then you're going to be much better at impersonation. I guess that's the crux. If you get better at impersonation, you're going to get better at extracting money from your target companies. And uh, Catriona Lowe, who's the ACCC deputy chair, she said in the weeks after those data breaches, there were hundreds of reports, an uptick in reports to Scamwatch. Now, I don't even think we've seen the half of it yet. Fraudsters are smart enough to know that there's no point acting straight away because um, you know, everyone's on alert post these data breaches. They're going to sit, they're going to enrich the data, they're going to wait for the right time, they're going to buy more data perhaps, and then they're going to roll these scams out over the next few months and years. So I think there's more coming. So, so that's really the crux of my talk today. But I'm going to then just spend the next maybe eight minutes, nine minutes, just talking about how you might respond and then just briefly glimpsing into the future. So how do you stop this? How, how do you respond to all of this? And at the heart of it, and I, and I, you know, I could unpack it and go through tactics and methods, but at the heart of it, you want to get closer to the cyber team. What finance does and what your IT team does or your technology department, or if you're a smaller business, just who's ever responsible for your IT controls and measures, you want to start working more closely with them. You want to help them and you want them to help you. Um, this is this is kind of a line of thinking that's really been championed by Nigel Fair. He's the ex-lead investigator for the AFP, Australian Federal Police's High Tech Crimes Unit. He's got a great book on this, which I'll just reference at the back. But he he sees cybersecurity as really increasingly the responsibility of the CFO because he says cybersecurity is really about getting money increasingly, not, not just about data. And it, it might sound semantic or a bit nuanced, but we speak about cyber crime strategy as opposed to cybersecurity because cybersecurity is really a term that's about network and technology and protecting data. Cyber crime um, is, is the term really about protecting finances. And cyber crime strategy, in our view, and building on Nigel Fair's thinking, is really about five things. Okay. It's about training, culture, financial controls or internal controls, pressure testing those controls and technology. Training, really important. You, you need to train your staff, your own team with the broader organizations about what to look for. If you've got the budget, bring in professionals. There are many. If you don't have the budget for professional training, at least start 
with, with signing up to emails, websites. Um, the ACCC is a good one. They've got a scam watch report. The OIC has someone, ID Care. They're all these organizations that for free provide newsletters that keep you up to date with scams. Okay, because you need to know what to look for. If you can get better training, that's really good. Something you also want to train people on is passwords, um, good hygienic use of passwords. Um, that's a very quick, powerful win for any organization. Trainings for naught if you don't have culture. We speak a lot about culture. It's like a soft thing that can have a very hard knock. What do we mean by culture? I can really focus on one thing. You need a high shame threshold. We've been speaking about this for some time. If you've got a culture where people are embarrassed to put up their hand and say, I've clicked on the wrong thing, or should I click on this? Or I left my laptop, I left my company laptop in a cab. They, if they are embarrassed or reluctant to do that, you're giving crime more time. And cyber crime is like a forest fire. If you leave it, it's much harder to put out. So you need to create a culture and you really need to enforce that. It's okay for people to make mistakes. They just need to notify their manager or IT or yourself as fast as possible. Okay, and you need to be able to share it. Then you've got internal controls. Now, as when we talk to finance professionals, we don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but we will say this. A lot of companies, it's, it's easy to know policy. It's harder to keep them alive. We all know about segregation of duty, but are you keeping it lived and breathed and practiced every day? Callback controls. They're effective if done perfectly. Um, there are many ways to get them wrong. Fraudsters get around them all the time. I could speak for another 10 minutes on just imperfect versus perfect callback controls. What I would do to find out whether your financial controls are good or pressure test them. You know, in the IT world, we penetration and pressure test IT controls. Why don't we do the same in finance? Create a, a send a, file, a manipulated invoice into your team, change a phone number, change an ABN, um, write an email from uh, a senior person instructing a junior person to make a strange payment to an unknown supplier. These are all credit duplicate invoice. Pressure test your controls and then improve them. And then lastly, there's technology. And it's, um, it's become a bit popular for technology vendors to not oversell. So we don't want to oversell our services. So we say you don't need everything. But I want to put another point of view out there, which is as the world gets more complex, you probably need more tools. I think, you know, if I look at in marketing, we used to have just CRM. Then we have CRM and Google Analytics. Now we have CRM, Google Analytics and meeting tracking tools. Uh, language listening software, lead enrichment. And, and that's valid because the world gets more uh, complex and complexity re requires that your people get support. And, and, and so you probably need some more technology. You don't need all of it, but you need to keep up to date and, and fill gaps. So, so that's a strategic response. In, in terms of where it's all going, well, uh, cybercrime evolves as technology evolves obviously um, and cybercrime is as much about psychology as technology so on the psychology side tactics keep changing and on the technology not uh, side you know techniques also keep changing so just some tactics we've seen changing age the use of age creditor lists fraudsters extract age creditor lists and use those to create better timing a call ahead's an interesting one if you've put callback controls in place and a fraudster is trying to manipulate you through email they will phone ahead and inform you that their bank account has changed because it kind of avoids the callback control. Reverse BEC, we've seen a frauds to get into a system and then actually announce to all that suppliers, customers, hey, we've been compromised, don't pay this bank account. And then a few days later, again, the fraudster goes back and says, oh, we've sorted out the issue, now pay into this new bank account. And of course, video conferencing creates a, a, a whole plethora of opportunity um, to, to create scams. Um, technology really changes. We're right at the beginning of an AI era, uh, which is both amazing and terrifying. Um, maybe the best way to talk about technology changing is just to take a quick look at this. So I'm not sure if you can hear that, but it sounds exactly like Morgan Freeman, looks like Morgan Freeman. It's obviously not Morgan Freeman. Uh, that's been created by some software called MetaHuman, freely available, um, where you can create, you know, likenesses. And 
I, I saw an interesting article. I don't know if, uh, how many, how old people are who are listening to this webinar, but uh, Justine Bateman's a really well-known actress. Um, she's J Jason Bateman's sister. She was also in a whole lot of series, uh, especially in the 80s and 90s. She's a very good actress. But more interestingly, she actually, uh, as a, I think a 49-year-old, went to UCLA or a very good university and became a computer scientist and got a master's in computer science. And she's been talking about how AI can really affect the movie industry and actors' rights around their likenesses. So that's where it's going. Um, I think the solution to that stuff is is really about having communal responses. Um, stay close together with your uh, cyber leads and your technology. Practice, you know, consider the cyber crime strategy. Um, I'm not going to talk about FCHO's product today, but I, I will say this, that we sit in the technology bucket. And what we do is if your IT team are locking the front door, we make sure the back door is locked. Um, and we've got a really unique solution to really bring financial controls in the digital age. And we're quite unique in being able to stop these email compromise and payment diversion scams. Um, but if you want to know more about our product, um, uh, you, you can contact Adriano or, or, or reach out to me directly or, or go to our website. Just some further reading today. Um, I must uh, sort of nod my hat to Nigel Finn, and his book, Cybercrime Australia. It's fascinating. And a lot of our so strategic thinking is built on that. And then we've got a whole lot of stuff on our website. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you got some value today. Certainly take a couple of questions. Um, or as Adriana said, you can reach out to me uh, directly and we can get them on. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gavin. I think that was really, really interesting. Also, I guess, quite scary as well. I'm not sure. I, I know you shared the, have I been um, pawned yeah. notice? Honed. Um, yeah. And then I don't know if you saw that ABC one that got released as well. That was quite interesting as well, I thought. Um, yeah. Slightly, yes, as Laura said, fascinating and scary. Um, I have, whilst you were presenting, had a gr brief chat with your, as you described him, somewhat handsome head of marketing. Um, and he has agreed um, to share the slides. So um, for everyone on here sure. who has been requesting, um, we will be able to um, share those around and, uh, and the recording as well. Um, so um, thank you very much, everyone. And Gavin, again, thank you so much for your time. And, and also um, the team at Fshore, uh, they are a huge supporter of um, the CFO Summit uh, as well. So um, couldn't do it without you. So next up, um, we have two uh, big sessions. So one is looking at how fiscal responsibility um, is uh, how you can improve that fiscal responsibility and make that sort of best practice spend control. Uh, and then we also have, um, how can you preserve company culture uh, doing, during cost cutting? So two big sessions there. Um, again, thank you, Gavin. Um, I will jump off now. Again, looking forward to seeing you on the next session and um, speak soon. Cheers, bye.